Okay, so this is the seventh lecture. Uh, so we're going to discuss a topic called independence of events. So um, independence of events is a relationship whereby assuming that one event happens has no effect on the probability of the other event. So it's a concept with a self-suggestive name. You know, if you think about what independence means in ordinary language, it's like reasonable to understand why people took that word and applied it to the epistemological concept described at the sentence at the top of the page where you assume one event and it has no effect on the likelihood of the other. There's no dependent relationship between these two events. And, um, when we um, study random variables later on in the course, we'll lift the definition for independence of events to a definition for independence of random variables. And in that context, we'll have a concept of correlation and we'll define independence as the absence of correlation. Or, well, well, we'll see that independence implies the absence of correlation. So if you think about dependence or correlation or some sort of um, relationship like that between two phenomena, uh, this idea is supposed to suggest the absence of dependence or um, correlation or causal interface. It's like assuming that one event happens doesn't change the probability of the other at all. So, you know, independence is a very important concept in the mathematics of probability, but it's also important to understand why this is such a important concept for the applications of probability. If you think about um, the common ways people understand randomness and likelihood, there's a fundamental idea people have that certain events have no causal relationship and cannot reasonably be connected with each other. A famous example people use is which party the president belongs to and whether there's a major earthquake in the U.S. during that term. So, you know, obviously having a major earthquake during a president's term is a bad thing, but nobody thinks it's reasonable to blame the president for earthquakes. And the way we would form that, relate that mathematically is to say that the incidence of earthquakes is probabilistically an independent event from the party of the president. It's like, you know, the party of the president doesn't change the probability of earthquakes, so it's not reasonable to suggest some sort of causal relationship or correlation between the party of the president and uh, earthquake that happened during their term. It's just, you know, people attribute this mathematical 
relationship of independence to all kinds of things in daily life where anyone with common sense can just say, oh, that's a complete coincidence that these things happen together. You know, there's no actual correlative or causal relationship between them. These are independent events and, you know, the whole point of a lottery is to prey on poor people's understanding of is to prey on poor people's lack of understanding of this concept you know the promise of a lottery is that you can somehow affect the result by choosing your numbers in a lucky way or going to the store at the lucky time of day or you know trying to put your best friend's birthday every time or you know people have all these ideas of what they're doing that actually affects their probability of winning the lottery but the mathematical fact is that all of these superstitious behaviors are probabilistically independent of winning the lottery and your chance of winning the lottery is whatever they tell you it is, one over 500 million or something, and the particular way you go about filling out your lottery ticket is completely independent of that. You can't affect your probability of winning the lottery by choosing your numbers in some sort of lucky way. Okay, so that's kind of a background explanation about the kind of common sense phenomena that's supposed to be captured by this mathematical concept. So now let's get into discussing how to formulate this mathematically. So you can see what I have highlighted in teal is the definition of two events being independent. It says that the probability of the conjunction of these two events is the product of the individual probabilities. So this equation is obviously zero equals zero if one of the events has probability zero. So if A is impossible or B is impossible, both sides of the Teal equation are zero. So that's not super interesting, but if these probabilities aren't zero, we can see why this equation highlighted in Teal is the right thing to capture the epistemological idea written in the sentence at the top of the page because the equation highlighted in teal implies that the probability of a given b is the same as the probability of a so knowing b doesn't change the probability of a and similarly it implies that the probability of b given a is the same as the probability of b so knowing A doesn't change the probability of B. So, you know, if we think of conditional probability as updating your beliefs about likelihoods based on new knowledge, it's telling you that independence of, if events are independent, then you shouldn't change your beliefs about likelihood at all for the one event given information about the other. And so, you know, when I was going back to the silly example with politics causing earthquakes, it's like, well, if you know which party controls the White House, that shouldn't change your beliefs about the risk of dying in an earthquake living in LA or whatever, you know? It's like, if you want to live in LA, you have to think about the risk of dying in an earthquake and that's something you have to deal with but nobody reasonably changes 
their beliefs about the risk of an earthquake based on, you know, what happened in Washington at noon on January 20th. So the conditional probability being equal to the unconditioned probability is a mathematical way of saying that knowing that B happened is not going to change my beliefs about A at all. And knowing that A happened is not going to change my beliefs about B at all. If you want to work this backwards, you could say that, okay, so let's say A is the party that, of the president and B is a terrible earthquake in LA. And so now we can think, okay, so probability of B given A equals probability of B. Probability of earthquake given president is probability of earthquake. So that's very reasonable. But what does the other thing say? It's ridiculous, but true. It says probability of president given earthquake equals probability of president. So how do we interpret that? It's like, let's say you're living in Los Angeles and you really, really hate politics and you never ever watch the news so you don't know which party controls the White House and then you observe a gigantic earthquake and you know about that because it's right in your own house and then after the earthquake you think to yourself hmm should I update my beliefs about politics given that I just saw that earthquake so you know I have absolutely no idea which party controls the White House but I may have some probabilistic estimates for that. Should I change my estimates for who controls the White House based on the fact that I just saw an earthquake? And the answer is no, that's equally as fallacious as changing your beliefs about earthquakes based on who controls the White House. So, you know, Changing your beliefs about earthquakes based on the president is ridiculous, but changing your beliefs about the president based on earthquakes is also ridiculous, even if the second thing is ridiculous in the first place. So that's what we see from these equations on the middle of the page, you know? We're saying that we have this equation highlighted in teal, which is the definition of independence. And except in the trivial case where both sides of the teal equation are zero, we can reevaluate it in two equivalent symmetrical ways as saying that the probability of A given B is the probability of A, and the probability of B given A is the probability of B. And so any time you see one of those conditional probability equations, you should have it in your mind that this is the definition of independence, and even though reversing conditional probabilities doesn't usually allow me to do this in a simple way, if I have a specific equation where conditional probability has no effect, then I can reverse it and get the third thing where probability of B given A is probability of B. Okay, so the simplest example to show you probability, the, the concept of independence, is the um, experiment where you flip two independent fair coins. So you can see I have the four outcomes of this experiment in a table at the bottom there, and I've marked in blue the outcomes where the first coin is heads, and I've marked in red the outcomes where the second coin is heads. And so we can see that the probability of A is a half, and the probability of B is a half, and the probability of A and B is one fourth, which is the probability of A times the probability of B. So the event of having a heads on the first coin is independent of the event of having heads on the second 
so, so, so yeah, the, the, um, actually, let me, um, erase the word independent here, because I think it's a little bit confusing to put it in this part. What we're doing is we're flipping two fair coins, and we're verifying that, um, uh, we're verifying that A and B are independent. Okay, so um, this is the simplest example of two independent events, and you know, this hopefully conforms with your intuition if you say, yeah, you know, if I flip two fair coins, getting heads on one has no effect on the chance of getting heads on the other. Okay, so let's have a look at another example. So consider an experiment where two fair dice are rolled. So um, we are asked whether the event that the first one is even is independent of the event that the second one is less than or equal to two. So this is still a pretty simple example and so we'll be able to approach it by the brute force method of probability, which is just to list out the entire sample space and count. So, um, you know, when we get to the later parts of this course and we're dealing with continuous random variables, we'll have to use calculus and you can't just list out the sample space and count, but theoretically, if you have a discrete event and um, you're asked any question, you can solve it brute force by lifting out the entire sample space and counting. Like with any brute force approach, this becomes very time consuming and computationally expensive if you pursue it in difficult situations, but theoretically Problems about finite probability spaces can always be solved by listing out and counting. So that's what we'll do here because this is the simplest example and it's worth taking the simplest approach to the simplest, to, to a very simple example. So we're going to write a table. You can see I have here where we have the first, the outcome of the first die written on the top labeling the columns and we have the outcome of the second die written on the left labeling the rows and so um, we can shade in the two events that the question asks us about so let's say A is the event that the first die is even, and B is the event that the second die is less than or equal to two. And so I shaded the outcomes that fall under the first event in blue, and I shaded the outcomes that fall under B in red. And so this, since the question contains the word fair, we know that this is a uniform probability space and we can approach it with the uniform probability formula, which does the count of your um, event divided by the count of the total sample space. So. The count of A is 18, the count of B is 12, the count of A and B is 6, and the count of the sample space is 36. So 
we can calculate the relevant probabilities and we can verify that th the events A and B are independent because the probability of A and B is equal to the product of the probability of A with the probability of B. So we verified that these two events are independent. You can see from the visualization I have on this page and in a simpler way on this page, there seems to be a connection between the probabilistic notion of events and the um, geometric notion of perpendicular vectors because if you have if you look at the what's going on in this page uh, the event b looks like two horizontal vectors and the event a looks like three vertical vectors and you can see kind of that the reason this calculation is working out for us is because the vectors in the event A are perpendicular to the vectors in the event B. So I won't say, well, I will say a little bit more about that connection later on when we discuss random variables, but it's a connection that goes very deep right to some of the most important unsolved problems in contemporary theoretical math. This idea that probabilistic independence is somehow connected with geometric perpendicularity. Okay, so let's look at uh, another example um, of how we can um, understand independence. So um, let's consider a game where each player is given a full deck of cards and then they choose six cards uniformly at random to return to the dealer. So each player is given 52 cards and then they choose six cards uniformly at random to give back a total of 12 for yeah, so each player gives back six and they give back a total of 12. So assuming the player's choices are independent, what is the probability they return 12 cards of the same suit? Okay, so let's try to make some convenient notation here by listing out the four suits with natural numbers. So we'll say that spades will be the first suit, clubs will be the second suit, hearts will be the third suit, and diamonds will be the fourth suit. I think that's actually wrong for how they're usually ranked in card games, but, you know, doesn't matter for solving math problems. Um, so we'll let AK be the event that the first player returns all cards from suit K, and we'll let BK be the event that the second player returns all cards from suit K. So what we're looking for is the disjunction the fourfold disjunction of the conjunction with AK and BK. So 
AK and BK is the event that the players return 12 cards of suit K. So AK and BK is one of four cases in the event that we're looking for. Because the you could have both players return all spades, both players return all clubs, both players return all heights, or both players return all diamonds. And so what we want to do is calculate the probability of the fourfold disjunction of AK with BK. So we can start off by using the independence hypothesis to say that the probability of AK and BK is the probability of AK times the probability of BK. And um, we can say there's, now we can use the uniform probability formula and say that there's 13 to six outcomes where um, all six cards are chosen from the suit K and we're gonna divide that by the total number of 52 choose six outcomes. And so then we can take the ratio and take the product of these two ratios to get the probability of AK and BK. So now we can think that if the players return everything from spades, that's exclusive with them returning everything from clubs. So we can say that AK and BK is mutually exclusive with AJ and BJ when K is different from J. And so what we're going to to do is look at the probability of the disjunction from k equals 1 to 4 of ak and bk. And since these four events are mutually exclusive, we can convert this into the sum from k equals 1 to 4 of the probability of ak and bk. And then we can use the calculation on the bottom left to say that the probability of AK and BK is 13 to 6 over 52 to 6 all squared. So we end up with a final answer, which is uh, 4 times 13 to 6 squared over 52 to 6 squared. And this comes out to be roughly 2.84 times 10 to the minus 8. So this is an extremely unlikely event. You can think of it as, um, yeah, it's like even more difficult than simultaneously drawing two flushes in poker. So if you had two players playing poker on adjacent tables, um, and they drew two flushes simultaneously, um, that would be even more likely than this event. This would be like drawing two six card flushes simultaneously. Okay. Um, So now we want to extend the concept of independence to collections of multiple events which do not affect each other's probabilities. So um, we had a definition of independence for a <coughs> We had a definition of independence for a pair of events, and then we were able to um, do some calculations based on that. 
but if you want to talk about independence for collections of more two than two events, it's not enough to just repeat the two event definition for every pair of events in the collection. If you want to define a useful concept of joint independence where you're saying that none of these events affects each other's probability, you need to assume not only the two event independence equation for each pair in the collection, you also need to assume that larger disjunctions from the collection also split into products of probability. So in the middle of the page, I have four equations highlighted in teal, which are the definition of independence for a collection of three events. And you can see I'm emphasizing the point that um, the three equations, the first three equations where you just apply the two event independence formula are not enough to satisfy the definition of joint independence. To satisfy the definition of joint independence, you also need to have that the triple disjunction decomposes into the triple product of the individual probabilities. So you can see on the middle right, I have a visualization which is a higher dimensional analog of this visualization on the bottom of the very first page. So when we were flipping two fair coins, we had this square and two events which were perpendicular lines. And then we can visualize flipping three fair coins as a cube with three perpendicular planes for the events. So um, again, this is just a heuristic to help you think at this point. I'm not making rigorous definitions to connect independence to perpendicularity, but um, hopefully this visualization with the cube lets you see a picture of triple independence where we would say that, okay, there's A is the top face and B is the right face. So A and B is the two cubes in the top right edge. And so probability of A is four over eight, probability of B is four over eight, probability of A and B is two over eight. And you can, or sorry, prob yeah, probability of A and B is two over eight. And you can do the same calculations for C and A and the same calculation for C and B. And then you can see that there's only one cube, which is at what looks like the one closest to my eyes sticking out in the front, where there's a blue dot on the top, a red dot on the right, and a green dot on the left. And that one cube is the only thing in the triple intersection. So the probability of the triple intersection is 1 over 8, which is 1 half times 1 half times 1 half. So, um, yeah, we can see the image of triple independence like that. We also have a definition on the bottom of the page for independence of an arbitrary collection of events. So when you have an arbitrary collection of an arbitrary finite collection of events, um, you can say that these are jointly independent if you pick any subset 
of at least two in the collection and find that the probability of the conjunction over that subset equals the product of the probabilities. So, you know, this, how many equations are there compactly specified in the bottom one that's highlighted in teal? Well, we have a different equation for every choice of at least two elements from my set. So I can say that to choose k elements, there's n choose k equations, and then I'm adding that up for all values of k between 2 and n. So I get the sum from k equals 2 to n times n choose k equations, and that works out to 2 to the n minus n minus 1. So, you know, the definition of independence becomes more and more complicated the more events you put into it. You can see the number of equations in the definition grows exponentially with the number of events, but I'll only ever ask you to explicitly deal with the definition of triple independence and when there's questions about higher versions of independence it'll always be set up so that you can deal with it a little more abstractly and you won't have to write out gigantic numbers of equations for various sub-collections of these events. Okay, so let's see an example of how we can work with this concept of joint independence. So let's say that a system has three parallel components, each of which has a 30% chance of failing within a year. So, assuming that these failures are jointly independent, what is the probability the system functions for an entire year? Okay, so the let's make an event A for what we're trying to find out. So we'll make an event A, which talks about the func system functioning for a whole year. And then we're going to make three other events, B1, B2, and B3, which correspond to the kth component failing in this year. And the question gives us that the probability of BK is 3 over 10. So, we need to interpret this word parallel that's given in the question. And what that means is that the system fails only if all three of the components fail. So, if the components were in series, system failure would be the disjunction of the three BKs. But since the component is in parallel, System failure is the conjunction of the three BKs. So series means system failure is the or statement of individual failures. Parallel means system failure is the and statement of individual failures. So we can see the event that the system fails is the conjunction B1 and B2 and B3. And since the question tells us that these events B1, B2, and B3 are jointly independent, we can see that the probability of the triple conjunction is the triple product of the individual probabilities, which is 3 tenths times 3 tenths times 3 tenths, which gives us 27 over 1,000. And so we can say the probability of A is 1 minus the probability of A complement, which gives us 1 minus the probability of B1 and B2 and B3, which gives us 0 0.973.
So you can see the huge advantage of putting components in fit in parallel as a way of reducing the chance of system failure. Like the original system only has a 70% chance of working for a year, but by putting three parallel components, you boost that to a 97% chance of working for a year. So you can think of, you know, on an engineering level, designing a single component that works 90%, 97% of the time is a vastly harder technical challenge than designing a component which works 70% of the time and putting three of them in parallel. But as you can see for this example, those end up having the same effect. So let's see a more sophisticated example related to joint independence. So consider a sequence of jointly independent coins where the nth coin has a probability 1 over 9n squared of landing on heads. So the first coin has a 1 ninth probability of landing on heads. The second coin has a 1 over nine times four probability of landing on heads. The third coin has one over nine times nine. The fourth coin has one over nine times 16, so on like that. A demon offers a, us a contract where we flip the nth coin at 12.01 a.m. on January 1st, 2021 plus n. And we live to 12.01 a.m. on January 1st, 2021 plus n plus one, if and only if that coin is tails. What is the probability we live forever if we take the contract? Okay, so let's think about this existentially profound contract where every year we flip a coin and we die if the coin is heads, but the coin has a rapidly decreasing probability of landing on heads. So we'll, let's make an event AN where the nth coin is tails. So AN is the event that we survive the um, nth coin flip. So the event that we live to year 2021 plus N plus one is the event that we survive all of the previous coin flips. So we can define an event BN, which is the conjunction of all of the previous coin flips that represents us having our life sustained by this demon contract because we keep winning the coin flip. And so we can say, all right, the question gives us that the probability of a n is 1 minus 1 over 9 n squared because a n is the event that the coin does not land on ta heads and it tells us the, the 1 over 9 n squared probability of landing on heads. So we can say that the joint independence of these events means that when we take these long running conjunctions to define BN, those conjunctions always split into products of the individual probabilities for AN. So the joint independence of the events AN allows us to express the probability of BN as a product of this probabilities of a n. So what we want to find is the conjunction from n equals 1 to infinity of b n. So b n is the event that we live until 2021 plus n plus 1, and we want to figure out the event that we live forever. So we can express that as the conjunction of 
living until year 21, 21 plus n plus 1 for all values of n. Now, living from living till the next year obviously implies that you live till the previous year because you to live till the next year you have to win the n plus first coin flip n plus one first coin flips and to live to year n you only have to win the first n coin flips so living to the next year implies living to the previous year and so we can we have a decreasing sequence of events and we can use the downward continuity probability equation for probability to say that the probability of the infinite conjunction is the limit of the individual probabilities so we calculated on the previous page from joint independence that we could express the probability of bn as the products of all the probabilities for an. And then we know that the probability of each event ak is 1 over 9k squared. Let me fix this typo. So we know that the probability of A1 product up to probability of An is the probability from k equals 1 to n of 1 minus 1 over 9k squared. And so we get the product from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 minus 1 over 9n squared. So evaluating this product can be done in a very elegant way using what's called the Euler sine product, where you know that sine pi of x over pi of x is the product n equals 1 to infinity, 1 minus x squared over n squared. So this is a theoretical mathematician's approach to evaluating this product. The Euler sine formula that I have there is proved using complex analysis. Um, it's something that is true about real numbers, but needs complex numbers to prove, which makes many mathematicians think of it as a thing of great beauty. But you can use complex numbers to prove this formula about real numbers. And if you know this formula, then you can plug in x equals one third and evaluate this as sine of pi over three of pi over three equals three root three over two pi. So if you're less interested in mathematical elegance, you can just plug in product n equals one to infinity one over nine n squared to Wolfram alpha and it will tell you that this is roughly 0.826. So let's try and think about what our calculation has told us in terms of the offer that was made by the demon. We can see that we're being offered an 82.6 chance of living forever, but if we go back and look on tw at 1201 on January 1st of next year, so January 1st of 2022, I'm going to flip a coin and there's a one ninth probability it's going to strike me dead. So despite having an 82% chance of living forever, this contract entails an 11% chance of dying next year. So <laughs> you can weigh the existential implications of accepting this contract on your own, but you know, it's um, just kind of a silly thing to make the point that there is a real mathematics to infinity and you can get explicit numerical answers to 
questions about infinite conjunctions and other infinitary operations in probability. And um, that idea only becomes more important as the subject goes on. Okay, so I'll end this lecture here.